We hear all sorts of threats and warnings from people in our society. The question is, what determines whether we believe them or not? Perceived credibility goes a long way in deciding if such claims are to be believed. Further still, if someone with credibility makes a claim that another person rebukes with higher perceived credibility, then the claim will not be believed in most cases. This is even true when the rebuking person comments about a topic outside of their area of expertise. Surely there's a better way. Unfortunately, there are many times when the people lacking credibility is completely correct. Let us take a look at four occasions when people tried to warn us, but were ignored. Ignat Semmelweis, who was a doctor that tried to save maternity mothers. In 1847, Ignaz Semmelweis worked as a professor's assistant at Vienna General Hospital. After observing numerous medical procedures, he concluded that if the staff would wash their hands, the spread of puerperal fever could be significantly reduced. Semmelweis immediately implemented a washing regimen that required interns to wash their hands using chlorinated lime solutions. As a result, the fatality rate from fever dropped from 10% to less than 2%. Despite these impressive results, his peers refused to accept Semmelweis's hypothesis. Since microbiology had not advanced to the point that the improvement could be as easily explained. Semmelweis was ultimately dismissed from his position at the hospital, with his reputation tarnished so severely that he was forced to leave Vienna and return to his native land of Hungary. After nearly two decades, Semmelweis was still a bitter man. He sent letters of outrage to obstetricians, calling them murderers. He started drinking and began to experience drastic mood changes. His family placed him in an asylum in 1865, where he died two weeks later. However, Joseph Lister was considered a pioneer of antiseptics and medicine, was honored for making the same discovery. He was even named president of the Royal Society, awarded a baronetcy by Queen Victoria herself. Yet Ignaz Semmelweis was ostracized and ridiculed by the medical community for doing the same thing years earlier. Claire Cameron Patterson, who was a scientist who warned us about lead contamination. An American geochemist named Claire Cameron Patterson developed the process of uranium lead dating along with George Tilton. This method allows scientists to determine the age of the Earth more precisely than any other method. However, he observed that humans were systematically poisoning themselves and the environment with lead during his work. For Patterson, this led to a lifetime campaign against the dangers of lead contamination. He was especially concerned with gasoline additive tetraethylet, known as TEL. Of course, such an attack against the powerful, greedy oil companies would not go unanswered. A toxicologist named Robert Kehoe became Patterson's main opposition, who was considered the number one science advocate for TEL. Kehoe was officially an employee of the Ethel Corporation as a medical advisor. He also operated a lab founded by Ethel, General Motors and DuPont. Even though when clearly biased, Kehoe successfully promoted how safe TEL was in the late 1920s. He even managed to convince the nation's Surgeon General. But Patterson would not give up on his warning. In the early 1970s, he demonstrated how Americans had lead levels some 700 to 1200 times greater than those found in 1600-year-old Peruvian skeletons. After this revelation, TEL was gradually phased out before getting completely banned. All the credit goes to Patterson, who refused to back down and campaigned for almost 30 years about the dangers of TEL. He pushed forward despite being ostracized by the science community and many others. Dusko Popov, who was a spy who warned the FBI about the Pearl Harbor attack. As a double agent from Serbia, Dusko Popov was in a unique position to possibly alter events leading to World War II. He had a James Bond reputation as he was notorious for drinking, womanizing and gambling. Unfortunately, it was his reputation why the FBI refused to believe Popov after he warned them about an impending Pearl Harbor attack. The warning took place in 1941 when he went to the United States, pretending to set up a spy network for his agency. Popov provided two forms of evidence. The first was a communique from a German official to Tokyo requesting information on the successful attack by the HMS Navy on the Italian fleet in Taranto, Italy. 
This implied that Japan was planning a similar strike. The other evidence was a German questionnaire about United States and Canadian air forces that Popov had been assigned to find answers for the Japanese. One third of the questions pertained to Pearl Harbor defenses. But Popov's vital information never reached the White House or US military leadership. Most believe this was because FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover personally disliked Popov. And in typical FBI fashion that we've seen so often, Hoover initiated a cover-up of the entire incident. Then in 1972, after British intelligence declassified documents about the case, the real story became public. Alan MacDonald, who was an engineer who warned of failure before the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. In the 1980s, an engineer named Alan MacDonald was director of the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Motor Project for Morton Thiokol. NASA contracted this engineering company to work on shuttle projects. It was in January 1986 when the Shuttle Challenger was preparing for a 10th mission. McDonald and his engineering team became very concerned about the cold weather. He believed that the weather could seriously affect the mission, and as a result, he would not sign the recommendation to launch. Yet people above his pay grade at Morton Theocol and NASA approved the launch anyway, and as we all know, it was a disaster. McDonald was concerned that freezing temperatures could affect the rubber O-rings, making them stiff. He argued that this could prevent them from maintaining a tight enough seal around the rockets. He knew that such a scenario could result in a burning fuel leak from joints in the booster and possibly cause the entire shuttle to blow up. Initially, McDonald was successful in persuading his superiors at Morton Thiokol, but NASA officials refused to heed the warning without supporting data. They insisted on proceeding with the mission. So when McDonald wouldn't sign the launch recommendation, his boss signed it for him, and the rest is history. So then the question becomes, what needs to happen before we choose to believe someone who warns us in the future? I think all of us would agree that many of those who have influence and not always the most credible or reliable. Perhaps the rising use of AI can help with this human dilemma. Thanks for watching.